Okay, great. I will move over and share my screen. Great. Okay, we didn't have any questions that came in, so thank you again for that presentation, and we will go on to our next presenter. So Albert Walsh is with Castle Rock Ranch in Kingston, Idaho, and he's going to be talking about regenerative agriculture and management intensive grazing. So Albert, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and let you share your screen. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Let's see, is that? All right, can you see my screen? I can see your screen, yes. All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. So my name is Albert Walsh. I uh, run Castle Rock Ranch. I've been using uh, mob grazing and adaptive grazing man for management for five years. We, uh, our cash crops are grass finished beef. We run a summer camp for girls age eight to 14 and we host weddings. Um, I'll admit I probably know, <laughs> you know, I don't know as much as I do. Or no, there, there's more that I don't know than I do know. Um, we're located in Kingston, which is up in the Panhandle. We get about 40 inches of precipitation. We're about 10 miles from the Continental Divide. We have a, you know, like a five or six month growing season. Our, uh, our ranch is 45 irrigated acres and then 250 dryland acres, but because we get 40 inches of precip, those are, you know, probably relatively wetter dryland acres than the rest of Idaho. Um, cattle is our main cash crop, but we do have goats, pigs, and chickens, and kids. So we've got some experience with some other livestock classes there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about regenerative ag today. It's a, it's a broad subject, but um, it's basically the idea of working with nature rather than against it, and it con combines a bunch of different ideas that pull from permaculture, holistic management, organic, even conventional and modern ag, and, and, and a lot of things. And these are, in general, regenerative ag is something that our grandparents or our great-grandparents would probably recognize more than people today would, because before World War II, this is, you know, more or less how people ranched and farmed. Um, they didn't have the same tools or resources available to them that we have today. And I'm not saying that everyone did this, but, you know, when you look at Europe and you see those, those you know, those livestock herds that would go up into the Alps in the summer, or they'd maybe graze in the foothills during the day and then come back onto cropland during the evening to deposit manure. Those are the concepts of mimicking nature, basically moving nutrients around, cycling nutrients, you know, and characteristics of that were animal impact, um, predator-prey relationships, and finding livestock that were adapted to their environment. Um, some of the principles of regenerative ag are basically capturing as much soil energy as you can. You know, most of us aren't, you know, we've got a lot of sunlight every day hitting our property that we're not really taking that carbon and doing anything with it. Also, uh, increasing our soil's rainfall capture ability. You know, like for me, we get 40 inches of precip a year, but my pastures still get super dry by the end of June. And that's really a function of, you know, it's getting better but it's kind of a function of what I've inherited. It's, you know, everyone up here says, oh, I wish I had irrigation. And I say, well, I wish I had better soil. Um, so building soil is always my goal. And along those lines, you know, bacteria and fungi in the soil are the big drivers. If you feed them, you feed the system and there's a positive feedback loop. You know, another principle of regenerative ag is kind of challenging paradigms. A lot of exist, you know, let me give you an example is calving date. A lot of producers calve their cattle in February or March. Well, there's a lot of research that shows that may not be the most profitable time of year to calf. So that'd be a paradigm that you might consider challenging, as one of many. And also, there's no one right way to do this. You know, there's principles to follow, but if you're building topsoil, you're doing something right. Um, the triple bottom line is basically the metric I go by. That's everything has to be a win for the ecosystem, the economy, and the humans. You know, if there isn't a win, then the system on all three of those fronts, then the system isn't sustainable we're, you know, mining our soil rather than building it, or we're hurting people or we're hurting the enterprise. And if we're not profitable long-term, we're not going to be around long-term to apply our principal management goals. Um, nutrient cycling is something I want to talk about a little bit. You know, the first step is to stop losing the nutrients you do have. This top photo is a photo of my cows in winter bale grazing, and this bottom photo is a spot underneath where the cows were bale, bale, bale grazing. And you can see that you know, the grass is much denser in that dark green. I'm sorry, I don't have a better photo of that, but basically there's about four times as much forage there as there is on the perimeter of it. 
And what that tells you is it kind of shows you what the potential of your ground is. And until you see something like that, you don't realize that you could be doing way better. I'm gonna show a little closer area of that, of that same picture here. Um, but basically fertility will solve pretty much all your problems. Weeds don't like poor, or, or weeds don't like very fertile soil. So it kind of solves your weed problem. You're gonna produce much more per acre. Your animals are gonna gain better. They're gonna be healthier. Um, so I use these dark, you know, a lot of times in a pasture you see at the end of June, you'll see these dark green spots. That kind of shows you where your potential is. That's where an animal might have defecated or urinated in May. The soil has consumed those, might, you know, those nutrients and done really well. But I use that as kind of a, a base of, hey, this is where I could be. And I know I can probably do even better than this. So to give you some metrics, like on average over the last five years, our ranch has gone from a ton of dry matter per acre to two tons per acre. And I think that we can get, you know, double that, at least double that again. So, you know, and the other thing I want to point out is a lot of us have never really even seen good soil. Like the, the resource that we've inherited is so degraded, but it's happened over such a long period, meaning a long period, maybe the last 100 years, 150 years, whatever it is, we don't even realize that we're, that we're growing on subsoil, that we don't even have any topsoil anymore. Like I dug a soil pit last year. There isn't, I have no topsoil. You know, it's, 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 I shouldn't say that. There's a little bit on top. It's starting to grow, but you know, most of us are, are really growing in very poor soil. We're working with a degraded ecosystem. So I want to talk about nutrients transfer a little bit. This is not my place, but this is a, um, a you know, just hay as an example. We need to start thinking about hay as mining soil. Now, I'm not saying don't cut hay. We need hay in northern Idaho and probably all of Idaho. Well, Jim Garrish would argue with me about that, but I think some hay is a good thing. But you have to put the fertility back where you took it from. So here's an example of these horses are living on a dry lot, eating, of a round, eating out of a round bale feeder. Hay is being cut somewhere else. Those nutrients are being transported here. And those nutrients are just leaching into the soil profile or washing away because these horses live here year round. Nothing gets a chance to take up these nutrients. Compare that to the bale grazing photo I showed you earlier where those cows were living on the pasture with the snow cover. They would, you know, any, any urine and manure was then taken up by the pasture the following spring. So you could, in theory, cut hay, feed that hay in the same spot. Or what I do is I, I use a manure spread. I use a dense bedding pack, kind of like Joel Salatin. And then I spread that anywhere I cut hay. So, um, yeah, you know, and, and you might point to some people's ranch and say, oh, well, they take, they take cutting hay every year, do nothing. They still have great hay. Well, that's because they inherited fabulous soil. You know, for us, where I live, most of our soil is really bad. So it becomes like I have a neighbor who cut, cut hay for two years in a row after never doing anything for, you know, 15 or 20 years. And the first year they cut the hay, they got 15 tons. The next year they got seven tons. And the third year they got four tons. So that's soil that, you know, weaker soils will respond much more quickly to that nutrient exodus. So I like to say you're either a, you know, you're either a miner or a solar panel builder. And a miner is someone that's cutting hay and just taking the nutrients out. A solar panel builder is someone that's improving their pasture. So along those lines, you need to be familiar with what your starting point is. Meaning, are you, are you starting with a good resource base or a depleted resource base? So for me, I'm starting with a depleted resource base, but lots of potential. I have irrigation, you know, I have livestock to help me remediate it. Um, but my, my ground was hayed for, you know, probably since the 1910s, really. There's been periods where animals were set stocked on it, but set stocking has its drawbacks too. Um, and so what I'm looking at doing is while my, while my pasture management is improving the ground, I, I've decided to start adding nutrients. So you see this tab here that says, how patient are you? If you're, if you're patient, just use good grazing management and over time you will fix the problem. But it might be years or decades. You know, if you're impatient, accelerate that a little bit. And so what these two photos here are, is the one on the left is my pasture before um, I spread bedding on it. And the one on the right is the same spot with bedding spread, so like a month later. And look at all these legumes coming up. These legumes, I didn't seed anything. This was just giving that soil a little nutrient bolt. And, that, and those legume seeds were sitting there waiting for the opportunity to sprout. I was pretty shocked by this, to be honest. Um, so yeah, that shows you what inputs can do for you. And I, I basically got lucky. I mean, I, you know, I've done soil tests, but the compost I'm spreading, I'm not analyzing that or it's not, you know, not particularly scientific, but obviously it's having a result. And I wish I had a photo of this pasture in another month, but it was like two feet tall and thick as anything. So um, some methods for building soil. You, uh, there's basically three things that I can think of. Grazing management, cover crops, and amendments. Grazing management is what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today. 
Um, and I think is the most important one to implement because if you go straight to cover crops and amendments, but you don't have good grazing management, you're just going to get right back to where you were before you did the cover crops and amendments in a little bit of time. So grazing management is always the most cost effective and important thing to implement first. Um, those are the three things I'm going to talk about. This photo on the right here is actually all three of those things in one. This was a one acre winter kind of early, late, you know, early spring, late winter bedding area that had about six inches of thatch on it. And I just went out on the 5th of July and broadcast a 12 species blend of cover crops on top of it and then grazed it the first week of September. So that's 60 days from the seed leaving the bag. No incorporation whatsoever. That's just broadcast. But it was a relatively rough surface and there was no other vegetation in there because of all the bedding. And, and I didn't do any fertility except for the winter bedding. That would be the amendment. And the seed is the cover crop. And then I went in and, <clears throat> excuse me, I went in and mob grazed it that first week of September. So your goals in your pasture management should be basically, you know, you're balancing your cattle performance and increasing your pasture fertility. And it's actually tough to achieve both those. A lot of people refer to it as kind of a seesaw. You're either doing one or the other. I don't entirely agree with that. I think there's a sweet spot where you can have your animals gaining and doing well and doing well by your pasture. This is my neighbor's property that same example I was talking about where they hate it for a couple of years and then realized that the custom hay contractor wouldn't do it anymore because it wasn't worth his time. Um, so they let me start grazing it. On the right there is the previous day. And on the left is where the animals obviously are now. And the, these animals are gaining well and they're eating a lot of weeds. On, there are things that people would generally consider weeds. I mean, there's a lot of red sorrel, tansy, uh, oxide daisy. You know, there's some grasses in there too, but it's really, it's not a productive pasture. But you can see on the right here, this pasture has responded amazingly to this mob grazing. You know, the productivity doubled from last year to this year, or I should say from 2018 to 2019. I'm excited to get onto it this year and see what it does. But you can see there's a fair bit of trample. We ate everything. You know, it was kind of a fine line of pushing those animals hard enough to sort of eat everything and cycle all those nutrients. This is early June. A lot of those weeds, you know, they come up early, they go to seed early. So my goal was to hit those while they were still vegetative. Weeds in particular are, are you know, they're kind of nature's cover crop. So if you're eating them, that, you know, these cows and horses are basically just 24-hour compost vats, you know, accelerated compost vats. So they're taking those weeds, they're composting, them, they're putting them back out their backside. And in our area, if you can get that manure on the ground at the end of May, beginning of June, when there's still precipitation and soil temperatures are good and ambient temperatures aren't too high, those nutrients will be taken up that year and you actually see a response. If you do it in August or September, usually a weak pasture like this is kind of dormant. That manure will sit there. I'm not saying it's not doing anything. You just won't see a bump that year. Um, you know, keys to pasture management are electric fence or herding. That's what allows, you know, that's your accelerator and your brake. You have to have one of those two. If there's a, you know, it, they both give you the flexibility you need. I'm not going to go into detail about, you know, management per se, but um, on the on the upper left there is, again, another one of those before and after pics. On the, on the right side of that photo is where the cows are, and now you can see all that tansy. On the left side, everything's been eaten. This cow on the right has actually got a bite of tansy in her mouth. There's a lot of weeds that people say cows won't eat. It's absolutely not true, you know, and they say they're bad for cows. I don't know. My cows eat a ton of tansy, a ton of red sorrel, a ton of oxide daisy. They get fat as anything. I mean, look at the coat on that cow. She's fat and happy. Um, so along those lines, my recommendation always don't spray an herbicide. Don't spray a pasture out. You're going to do way more damage to that pasture by spraying it than by, I would just say, do nothing. You know, those cows are going to eat almost everything. Are there some noxious weeds? Are there some regulations that might require you to spray? Yeah, but, you know, grazing is always your best option. Um, some other pasture management advice. Um, you know, along this kind of high stock density grazing, don't match your stocking rate to your spring flush. <laughs> I've made this mistake and a lot of people make this mistake. They say, hey, I got a ton of grass in June, so I'm going to match my stocking rate to June. Well, then come September, you're completely out of grass. Try and make your, set your stocking rate so that you are grazing until Thanksgiving is usually my rule of thumb. Even though the growing season is over by then, we don't usually have a lot of snow cover. And if we have, if we have some, the cows can still dig through it. But you want, I wouldn't, I, I, my goal is always to not feed any hay until December. If you're doing that, you're doing a good job of, of matching your stocking rate. Again, could you go later than that? Sure. But I think Thanksgiving should be considered a minimum. Um, in spring, you want to move fast and then you're going to slow down. So what does that look like? You know, in spring, your pastures might be, let's say you have 50 head. You might have a three acre pasture. You're building this with 
temporary poles and electric fence. And by summer, it might be half an acre. Because in spring, you just want those cows are just taking one bite and moving. Quick bites, quick bites. This cow, again, you can see the, all the red sorrel and oxide daisy in front of her. But it's given her a, you know, a diverse palette of nutrients. And these, are, these, these quote unquote weeds are growing in the soil because better grasses honestly won't grow there. There's not enough nutrition for them. So I'm grateful to even have those weeds. It gives the cow something to eat. And we're going to improve that soil by cycling those weeds and the nutrients in them. Um, you know, some other goals are try and trample half that forage, eat 40% and leave 10%. It's a tough thing to achieve, I'll be honest, especially when you have short kind of depleted pastures like that. Trample is tough. You have to have biomass to have a trample. But if you want to build soil, trample is the best way to do that. Um, and just know that your cows will eat weeds. The, uh, and probably the most overlooked thing in mob grazing is rest. I shouldn't say overlooked. I mean, people talk about it all the time, but you need to give that pasture rest. If you if you graze it and then it comes back and you're looking going, oh my goodness, that growth looks so amazing. Wait, stay off of it. Don't get it on it. Don't get it on it again until you start to see some seed heads. Rest is one of the most powerful things because what's happening is while that grass is growing, it's pumping carbon into the soil and building topsoil. Here's some photos of just some things we do at our place. You know, we have a we have kind of a mountainside that we this we graze from horseback. We use horses to herd it. I'm not saying it's the most cost effective thing to do. We really enjoy doing it though. The bottom left here is a lot of my neighbors have, I'm on the Coeur d'Alene River and a lot of my neighbors have recreation lots. And these, these neighbors allow me to graze behind their RVs. So right, right behind me where I'm, where I'm taking this picture is a road and the other side of those RVs is the, is the river. But what's neat is I'm able to pick up another 60 acres of grazing by, you know, grazing all these other areas that would generally just be mowed like lawns. And then on the right side here is uh, us grazing the actual side of the road. We're on the county's no spray list. They would be spraying an herbicide if we weren't doing this. But this is like, this is pretty high density. I mean, by the time these cows leave here, everything's been eaten or trampled. It's, I, I, I laugh sometimes that it's probably my best pasture, the side of the road, because I have to do high density grazing. You, know, you can see our push poles there. Some little tips there is when we, we put the push pole in, we try and put a height that, you know, sometimes we'll do a second wire to keep the calves in. But I'm usually standing there to stop traffic or just slow people down, which people drive too front, fast in front of my house anyway, so I don't mind doing that. Um, another premise is don't take it all. It comes back to trample. This is actually my neighbor's property. They only have two acres, but I sometimes I argue that they're the best grazers I've ever seen. They, uh, these are two pigs they were raising. And look at how much trample is on the right side here when they pulled those pigs out. Their pasture, even though it's only, it's probably their proper, whole property is two acres. This pasture is probably only one acre, but... They have some of the most beautiful pasture I've ever seen. They have no irrigation, but they always have tons of grass. Um, if you're gonna do mob grazing, you also have to be realistic about the genetics. While you can do it with any animal, some animals are gonna perform better in that system than others. Uh, these, these two animals I'm showing up here, the upper right is a bull I use. This was him as a yearling. Look at how short and stocky he is. I mean, he's a, he's a chunky dude. And this cow on the left, look at how slicked off she is. She's got a big, deep chest. She's not very tall. She's an Aberdeen Angus. Both of these are. I'm not saying that's the only breed. That's just, that's probably the majority of my genetics. I just find they get fat really easily. Um, and they thrive in that mob grazing. Because sometimes you have to push those cows to get, the, to get the result you want for the pasture. But know that, you know, within every breed, there are individuals that work. You know, I've bought sale barn cattle. And, you know, half the cows I buy fall out of the herd because they don't do great on mob grazing and the other half excel. And those are the ones that I breed and keep. Um, and, and all that said there, you know, like the heritage breeds do do really well. But again, don't get, don't get stuck on one breed. Uh, I want to talk about quality feed a little bit. You need to know when your grass is good because that's going to dictate part of your mob grazing because I'm going to use the term mob grazing adaptive grazing management, strip grazing, whatever you want to call it, kind of interchangeably here, but basically managed grazing where you're using electric fence and changing the size of your pastures. But when your grass is good, that's the time to get your cow herd fat because there's going to be times where you're pushing them on not as good of grass. So, you know, again, weeds can sometimes be very nutritious. You know, there's a woman, Kathy Voth, who uh, runs onpasture.com that has a really fabulous education pamphlet on, on getting cows to eat weeds, even noxious weeds that, you know, people like thistles that people swear they won't eat. But sometimes, and she's done some analysis on these, some of these weeds match alfalfa at certain times of the year. So know when your grass is good. I mean, if you're in the basin, 
you know, of Washington, we're in the panhandle, so we're pretty familiar with the basin too. But even cheatgrass pastures have a window where you can get gain on an animal. You know, and, and if you're wondering if the feed is any good, look at your animal's manure. If it's a nice pie with a dimple in the middle of it, it's doing great. If it's stacked up, they're missing protein. If it's really runny, there's too much protein and not enough fiber. But, um, you know, we say when I custom graze cattle for people, we always say that up here we have about 100 days of gain. You know, if we're doing yearlings, we'll turn them out, you know, rule of thumb, May 1st, and we'll pick them up August 10th. And after August 10th, our gain is pretty much gone. I'm not saying that's the same everywhere, but know when you have decent gain because it's going to change your management. Um, low stress handling. Here's a photo of some cows. I run a single wire for all my cows, even the ones that, you know, come, you know, that I'm custom grazing for other people or that come from the sale barn that have had no experience to electric fence before. Um, and the way we're able to do that is by, you know, making sure they have enough to eat, but also moving them often so they get used to it. And, uh, we never shout or yell at our animals, you know, it, that, that never is productive. And we have a couple sayings like, you know, fast is slow and slow is fast. Move slow. You know, cows move slow. You should move slow too. And if you do have a problem animal, don't hesitate to call it. So that kind of covers, you know, there's three principles I said I was going to talk about here in terms of building soil. The first one was pasture management. The second one is cover crops. And the third one is going to be um, amendments. So I'm going to talk about cover crops a little bit now. I showed you that picture at the very beginning where that steer was grazing cover crops. This is that same cover crop blend. This is my wife. I show the picture of her in here because she's not very tall. So it makes the crop look really impressive. But this is a 12 species blend that we just hand tossed out into bedding. You know, she's holding, I think, some millet there, but you've got turnips, forage peas, radishes, um, buckwheat. You can see the buckwheat there. You know, there's all sorts of stuff. But those that 12-way blend, it they all work. There's a synergy there. They all work together. They all promote different bacteria and different biology that bring up different nutrients from the soil profile. So the cows go in there, they graze this, and we've built some great soil. We've fed our cows well. It did cost us some money for the seed. Um, as a general rule of thumb, you can get cheaper cover crops, but a 12-way blend, <clears throat> you know, it's going to run you 40 or 50 bucks an acre. So not cheap, but it's a high, I consider it a high value investment for building topsoil. And the way you monetize it is by turning it in, into livestock feed. Um, it's not necessarily a tool for beginners because you need a little bit of an understanding of warm and cool season crops and, and how to make that soil contact. You know, a lot of people use no-till drills. I try and use animal impact because I don't have a drill. And I can't really justify spending the, you know, 10 or 15 grand on a drill plus the, the implement that's going to have to pull it. Um, but I'm not, I'm not trying to set it up as a barrier to, for people not to do. Cover crops are, I think, the most fun tool in our toolbox and, uh, and worth learning about. It's sort of outside the scope of this presentation to give you more information on that, but there's lots of great resources. Uh, I'm going to check these questions for a second. Okay, someone asked, um, you know, uh, to clarify, you put 12 species cover crop on your pasture, let it sit until September, then grazed it. So therefore, time and your cattle did all the work. So in this case, uh, the cattle didn't even help me plant it. There was enough texture to the bedding, and the bedding had suppressed any other growth that literally just hand broadcasting it, it came up. I, I, this was also irrigated. So I had some, you know, that's a pretty big advantage for planting something in July in North Idaho when precip is starting to run out. If you want to plant something on unirrigated ground, I would plant it. I would broadcast it in front of your cows, let your, you know, mob your cows up on top of it, let them push it into the soil profile. And I'd be planting it in either a cool season cover crop in the spring, or if you're going to try and do a warm season cover crop, do it in May. Watch that weather forecast because you don't want it to freeze. And, um, but those warm season covers are probably going to do the most for you because the biology that they promote is usually absent because we don't have very many warm season crops in Idaho. Almost all of our grasses and legumes and forbs are cool season. So if you can get a warm season, you know, mix to take, I think that's the best. And then, and how could I find an appropriate seed mix for horses, cattle, goats? Uh, talk to your seed distributor. Actually, the, really the best resource is greencoverseed.com. They have something called a, uh, the cover crop mix calculator that's a fascinating tool. You plug in your zip code and it immediately pulls up all the data on, you know, your area, rainfall, growing season, those things. 
and it makes some recommendation based on your goals. So I would start there. So that's Green Cover Seeds is the company. They're out of Nebraska. They also do a really fabulous annual soil health pamphlet that basically has articles from the leading scientists in soil health. It's free. They'll mail it to you. I just got mine last week. I stayed up all night reading it. I'd highly recommend that. Um, and then uh, Sheila Blackman asks, do the same principles apply when grazing horses? Is horse manure as good as cow manure in terms of soil fertilization? Um, I would say no, honestly. <laughs> uh, a cow is a ruminant. She's got four stomachs. She seems to break that. I, and look, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not speaking from a scientific standpoint here. I'm telling you from experience. Um, I'm not saying that horse manure isn't good. But I think cow manure tends to be better. Cows have a broader range of things they eat. Um, any ruminant, I think, is going to help cycle nutrients a little better than a, a single stomach animal. Uh, but again, not to knock horses. Horses are more grass dominant. You know, if you have a lot of cheatgrass, horses seem to do a little better on that than the cows. Um, and it depends on the class of horse. Is it a young growing horse or an older horse, you know, a, a mature horse? A mature horse can get roughed through stuff a little, a little easier than a, uh, than a young horse can who's trying to grow. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, we run horses with our cows and we ride a lot of horses and it's still worth doing managed grazing with horses. But the problem with the horse is they will not eat the weeds that a cow will or a sheep. Sheep are fabulous. I'm not here to knock sheep. I just really like the single wire electric fence that cows respect and sheep will not. And same thing for goats. You know, a perfect grazing setup would have every one of those species. You'd, you'd be eating every single plant in that pasture, cycling all their nutrients. But um, I don't know if I answered your question, but hopefully that does. Yeah. Um, uh oh, oh boy. Sorry. Got ahead of myself here. Oh no. Um, amendments. So this is kind of the third, third tool in your toolbox. I don't have a lot of experience with amendments. This will be my first year using them. I've always made my own compost. There's a few weeks in the fall and a few weeks in the spring where I bring my cows up into a barn that I've kind of modified so that they can, they live on a pile of wood chips. Every week I add more wood chips and it ends up being about four feet deep. This Joel Salton is, is pretty famous for this model. It's his piggerator concept. I do the same thing. This will be my first year turning pigs into it with corn, but Basically, I use that as my fertility, and it does wonders. It's wood chips, it's manure, it's urine. It's, I mean, we all of our cardboard, all of our wood ash goes in there. All my neighbor's cardboard goes in there. Um, any carbon source we can get goes in there. The cows tramp it all in, and then we um, compost it for a couple months in the spring, and then we spread it with our manure spreader. But in a perfect world, my cows are outside all winter, and as long as there's snow cover to protect the sod, I'm just feeding, if I'm feeding hay, I'm feeding out on grass. And then in fall, you know, I'm, I'm doing my daily pasture move like I usually do. And if you're moving every day, you can really protect that soil. I digress a little bit there. But um, getting back to amendments, if you have depleted soil, consider using amendments. Like I said, it's my first year using it, but I'm just realizing that I, compost is expensive. You have to have equipment. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of it. It's just a lot of volume. So if you're in an urban area where you can get wood chips for free and, you know, grocery scraps and you can, you know, let pigs live on it and collect their manure and cows live on it, that might be better. I'm, I'm pretty far removed from any urban areas. So I have to pay a tree trimmer to bring me wood chips. And I'm just finding that in the grand scheme of things, I'm going to start using, I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing my composting system, but I'm going to add some amendments to that too. So I'm working with a biological agronomist. So, um, he is helping me. We're going to be putting down two things. We're going to be putting down nutrients but we're also going to be putting down biology and biology is basically that's, you know, all these companies sell different things. It's basically compost tea, I think, but it's uh, it's basically bacteria and fungi that we're going to spray onto the crop in, in early spring. And then we're going to feed it with a nutrient blend. We're going to use a couple different things. One of the things we're going to use is a blended up um, crab and shrimp meal. It's uh, by Pacific grow. If you Google Pacific grow, you can see it, but it's high calcium has some nitrogen in it and it's an organic product. But uh, let me check these. Um, someone asked corral areas. I just scooped up a whole lot of horse manure. Probably got whatever was underneath it too. What do you recommend for a base since this will go to the compost pile? I apologize. In regards to a base, I would just say, you know, I make sure you have your carbon and nitrogen blend right and, and go ahead and put it on some grass after it composts for a little while. 
Um, some quick tips. We're nearing the end here. Take it slow and don't burn yourself out. I've made that mistake. Um, growing soil is an investment. You won't always see a return in that same year for it. So be careful to do it on own ground and not leased ground unless you have a very long-term lease. Be adventurous and experiment. You're gonna learn a lot from your mistakes. You're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, sometimes small subtleties make a big difference in how you're doing things. For example, if you're planting a cover crop and you didn't incorporate it well enough, or you did it at the wrong time of year, you know, maybe, you, you know, you have, you kind of have to get, I don't want to say everything right, but you have to, you know, if you took a cool season crop and tried to plant it in July, you're going to fail. You might've chose the right crop. You just did it at the wrong time. So do your research and make sure you're, you're, you're getting everything right. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, my wife tells me don't overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate what you can do in 10. And then some resources. I told you about green cover seeds. Uh, that's a great website, Holistic Management. Working Cows Podcast is one of my favorite. Gabe Brown is probably leading the charge on regenerative agriculture. You can see Greg Judy on YouTube. Steve Kenyon of Greener Pastures Ranching is on Facebook. And then if you, I, I love showing people around. If you want to see what I'm doing, feel free to stop by here. Great. Thank you, Albert, for that presentation. I went ahead and put a couple of the websites that you mentioned, the pacificgrow.com and and the greencoverseed.com into the chat. And when I was looking at the Soil Health Resource Guide, that is a free resource that you can just sign up and have them sent to you. So that's great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, it's three o'clock. We are right on time since you answered the questions as they came in. In, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our final speaker for today, and that's Jennifer Jensen. She's just going to be telling us uh, what is next in terms of this class. So, Jen, when you're ready, I will stop my share, and you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, thank you. I am just going to take a few minutes to talk about the action plan that is on the student page under the handouts for today. So hopefully you should be seeing that any second now. Yes, we see it. Perfect. Um, so just very quickly, first off, oops, the um, first thing that uh, you m will want to do after this workshop. What do you think that is? I know there's been a lot of information that we've learned today from all the different presenters, but take some time, look back through your notes. Maybe you need to look up your zoning regulations. Maybe now you're fascinated by a new breed of goat and you would like to research that or look into some online market op options for your farm. So what is it? What's that first thing that you feel like you need to do after this workshop? And then who's that person that you really need to call or talk to about this? If you are interested in sheep, maybe that's Melinda Ellison, or maybe it's the, your health department to talk about regulations or that planning and zoning department. So try to figure out who it is that can help you work through whatever your next step is. And then the most important piece of information that you need to find. Again, it might be the regulations in your area or for your enterprise. It could be that you feel the most important piece of information is knowing that price point so that you're making a profit, but also have a price point that the customers will purchase. And finally, just think about the biggest questions that you still have. This was a lot of information today, and we can't always go as in-depth as we would like. So hopefully the information you learned today has sparked more questions that you would like to find out more information on. So think about those, jot those down, and when Extension can help with those, contact us, or think about some of the other resources that Kate talked about in that first exercise. And I'll stop there because I don't want to uh, keep going too late. Okay, thank you, Jen. I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up our webinar today. So um, again, you can go and find all of these resources on 
the student web page and this is showing you some of the readings that are out there and the homework assignments. We will be adding more resources that we learned about today and links as well. So keep checking back to that. Mackenzie is going to work really hard to get all of these presentations up on the website by Tuesday in case you want to listen to any of them again. We understand that your farm, your customers, and the larger community are really being impacted by the coronavirus. And University of Idaho Extension really wants to be there to help, and we need to understand what's happening for you and your for, for your communities. So we're asking you to take a minute to complete this brief questionnaire. And if you go to our Facebook page, our Cultivating Success, or Idaho Small Farms and Local Food Facebook pages, you'll see this link to this survey. And again, it's in the handout on the web page. We would really appreciate your taking just a couple minutes to let us know what are some of the immediate information needs that you are hearing people need or that you need yourself? And then what are some of the things that we can offer in the next couple of months to support you and your community? Uh, you'll also have an opportunity to give us feedback in our post-workshop survey. We actually really appreciate that feedback and we have added another question about what type of other educational programs that we can offer you different topics or if you need some more in-depth information, what is it that we can put together to help you uh, move forward in the next couple months and as you grow your farm operation. Each one of your site instructors will be in contact with you to talk about how to do a wrap-up session. And so that's something to look for. I think those are probably going to be largely virtual in our current situation. And so watch for those emails at that wrap-up situ during those wrap-up sessions. You're going to have an opportunity to share, um, you know, where are you with your whole farm plan? What type of enterprises are you looking at developing? How do you plan to move forward? So although we might not be able to do those in person at every location, we are really excited to be able to hear from you through this webinar format. So if you have questions about the course, please contact your course instructor. instructor. If you have any um, assistance that you need through the website with any of the videos or the resources, please contact Mackenzie. With that, we really appreciate all of our participants on today's webinar, both those who were watching the presentations and our students in our course and the amazing presentations that were given by all of our presenters. Thank you. Have a very great rest of your afternoon and please stay safe.